Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name, as you know by now, is Sheila Riggs. I serve with Charles W. Cole, Jr. as co-chairman of the Board of Trustees of the Baltimore Council on Foreign Affairs. Our speaker here is Lieutenant General William E. Odom, Director of National Security Studies at the Hudson Institute and adjunct professor at Yale University. Before I introduce him, let me take this opportunity to draw your attention to the Council's next program, which will be next Wednesday, May 13th. Chase Uttermeyer, Associate Director for Broadcasting for the United States Information Agency, will speak to us about international broadcasting in a post-Cold War world. He, his speech will take place here at the Baltimore Grand. And now, let's go ahead with our guest. General Odom brings powerful expertise to bear on questions about the military in the former Soviet Union during these very uncertain times. He speaks to the large matter of national security requirements versus economic limitations in an epoch which seems to demand American global participation and leadership. General Odom has written widely on Soviet political and military affairs. His book, The Soviet Volunteers, was published by the Princeton University Press, and his articles have appeared in such journals as World Politics, Foreign Affairs, The Washington Quarterly, and others. He is a graduate of the United States Military Academy and received his MA and PhD degrees from Columbia University. After troop duty in Germany, General Odom completed the Army's four-year Russian Area Specialty Program. He served as a member of the U.S. Military Liaison Committee to Soviet Forces in Germany and as Assistant Attaché in Moscow. General Odom also taught Soviet studies at the U.S. Military Academy and served as a senior research associate at Columbia's Research Institute on International Change. During the Carter administration from 1977 to 1981, he was a senior member of the National Security Council staff and military assistant to the President's Assistant for National Security Affairs, Zbigniew Brzezinski. At the NSC, he worked on strategic planning, Soviet affairs, nuclear strategy, telecommunications policy, terrorism, and Persian Gulf security issues. From 1981 to 1985, General Odom served as Assistant Chief of Staff for Intelligence, the Army's Senior Intelligence Officer. As Director of the National Security Agency from 1985 to 1988, he was responsible for the nation's signals, intelligence, and communications security. Will you join me in welcoming him to the Council this evening, General William E. Odom. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mrs. Riggs, for those kind introductory remarks. Uh, whether, or not, whether or not they will enhance my credibility may be subject to question. Living in Washington, I may be a victim of the inside the beltway syndrome. Traveling each week, however, to New Haven to teach my courses at Yale takes me regularly outside of the beltway, but you might say that's just another glass bubble that keeps people out of touch with the realities in this country. Being a resident in a think tank, the Hudson Institute, may also induce skepticism on your part. Uh, thus, I start with more humility than you may uh, believe. I, too, am skeptical of ideas that come from think tanks. I never imagined I might end up in one. Uh, not long ago, I heard a man discussing think tanks, uh, wondering why they're called that. Uh, given their products, he thought it might be better to call them skeptic pools. <laughs> now, I've 
often asked just precisely what I may am asked, what precisely think tanks do. Now that's a difficult question. After a lot of contemplations, thinking about the Hudson skeptic pool, I have concluded that they really provide welfare for the idle intelligentsia. <laughs> and much to the public good. Just imagine all the trouble they would cause if they were on the streets unemployed. <laughs> or if you want to cast your mind back, imagine the Tsar in Russia. What if he had had think tanks? He would have never had a revolution. Or just imagine Lenin and Stalin toiling away on memoranda to the Tsar in some think tank in St. Petersburg. Sort of fascinating to contemplate. Now this is the first part of my uh, talk, the part devoted to truth in advertising. Uh, now that you've heard that, you have to sit up properly and pretend that what I say is at least serious, if not very profound. Actually, I want to try out some thoughts with you uh, that I've been contemplating recently. I think I believe them. Uh, they're still poorly developed, and perhaps your questions tonight will help me improve them. The question over which I puzzle a lot is whether the United States is wise to disarm precipitously, let its foreign security commitments lapse, reduce the federal budget for guns drastically, and to use the savings to purchase butter instead. Now, I don't know the origins of the idea of the guns butter curve, that is the economic concept that we can use our money to invest in the production of guns or the production of butters, that is consumer cons uh, the consumer economy. It implies, of course, that what we spend on defense is a complete loss to consumption. Now, this well-established idea seems to inform a lot of public discussion today about our defense budget now that the Cold War is over. It suggests that there is a defense dividend which we can retrieve from investment in uh, the military and reinvest in civilian programs or in tax reductions. Let me offer an example. Some time ago, I was testifying before Congressman Solars in the Joint Economic Committee and on the, in the Congress. And he tried to get me to agree that we should redefine national security broadly to include things like Head Start and highway reconstruction. He insisted that we should take money directly from NATO and put it into these programs. Now, it was fairly easy uh, to disagree with him because anyone who has experience with the budget process in the Congress knows well that any money that comes from defense will not go to the intended programs. It's far more likely to go into pork barrel spending than into Head Start or highways. But suppose for a moment that were not true and that we could make those kinds of trade-offs. Would we really like the consequences? I personally doubt we would. And I'll try to explain why. The, the simplest explanation is to draw an analogy between local law enforcement capabilities and the system of security alliances we now have in Europe and East Asia. Why do the best retail stores tend to choose locations in northwest Washington where the rent is high instead of southwest Washington and Anacostia where the rent is low? They might tell you that most of the well-off customers are in, Wash in the northwest part of Washington, but they would also add that robberies and violence in southwest would eventually cost them more than they would save in the cheaper rents. The U.S. alliance system uh, has provided international law and order in Europe, Western Europe, and in East Asia for 47 years. In that climate, the economies in both regions have prospered. If that international law and order system is now withdrawn, will those economies continue to prosper? Some of you will disagree with me, but I have serious doubts. Even if you agree, you may ask why the United States should pay for their law and order. Now, let me deal first 
with the consequences of dropping those security commitments in the two regions I mentioned, and then return to the issue of whether we really should continue to pay for them. If U.S. troops are pulled out of Germany completely and the rest of Europe, will Europe soon return to its, own, its old pattern of rivalries, maybe even eventually leading to wars? Is the same true for Japan, Korea, and China, and other states in East Asia? Many esteemed observers not only answer no, they ridicule the question. Members of the European community have too much to lose, they argue. So do Japan and South Korea and Taiwan. Furthermore, those countries are now democracies, and democracies seldom, if ever, go to war with one another. Now, in this view, there are no military threats in these regions or prospects of any in the future. U.S. troops, therefore, are an anachronism after the Cold War. They are a dead loss to our general welfare. Now, this line of reasoning has very sophisticated versions, and some very thoughtful people are compelled by it. My intuition, however, compels me to believe that it is mistaken. But that's not enough. Can an equally sophisticated counter-argument be developed? Let me try to make one for you. Among the narrow circles of people attentive to foreign affairs, such as you, scholarly theories tend to lend cogency to arguments and policies. Now, if you're not such a person, please bear with me, and I will try to make a few of these theories as simple and as relevant to this question as possible. Today, there are really two competing theories of international relations that bear directly on this question. The neo-realists, such as Hans Morgenthau, the late Hans Morgenthau, and Kenneth Waltz and the much younger scholar John Mearsheimer, insist that stability in the international system that is, order and peace among states is possibly only when there is a solid balance between two hegemonic powers or when a single hegemonic state dominates all of the other significant states. When there is no such hegemony, relations inexorably drift into anarchy, competition, and wars. This happens, they argue, in spite of the efforts of leaders to prevent it. Now, if they are right about this theory, then the end of the Cold War means we're headed to increasing international anarchy and disorder unless some power can assume a new hegemonic role. The only candidate is the United States, but it no longer has adequate power to assert global hegemony. Thus, as Professor Mearsheimer has recently argued, uh, we are headed for anarchy in Europe. He called his article, Back to Anarchy in Europe. Now, the alternative theory, typified by Professor Cohane of Harvard University, holds that the experience, that with experience, states learn the advantage of cooperation over competition. He tries to show that the increasing competition in Western Europe after World War II occurred even without American hegemony. We exaggerated our own notion of the hegemonic character, the power we had there. We never really had that much influence. The Europeans have managed to learn to cooperate rather than to compete, and they've learned that by themselves. Now, if Cohane and his followers are right, both Europe and East Asia are gripped by a new dynamic in international relations. Whether or not the old security ties with the United States are retained, both regions will continue to enjoy peace and prosperity. Now, I'm personally not compelled by either one of these theories, although I think both capture part of the larger truth. If the neo-realists, the first group, are right, then we are in fate's hands, lacking adequate power to impose a new hegemony over Europe and East Asia, or perhaps the rest of the world, we're doomed to allow both regions to drift inexorably to anarchy and perhaps eventually to war. There were periods in Europe when no single power dominated the continent. 
yet long periods of peace were maintained. After the Thirty Years' War, the Peace of Westphalia in 1648 was designed to end that long conflict. That required limited cooperation among several states which hardly trusted one another. Not surprisingly, they eventually found new reasons, not covered by the agreements at Westphalia, to return to war. Uh, in the next century, uh, the Treaty of Utrecht was one of several that marked a similar kind of effort to create an international security system in Europe. And then in 1815, the Congress of Vienna leaders again showed that they could create uh, a stable peace for a period of time. Now, the point to this historical exploration, I think, should be fairly obvious. Leaders do make a difference. None could dominate Europe, but together they did hold in check for a while the forces that the neo-realists insist, insist cannot be checked without a hegemonic system. Now, the same historical evidence also makes me unwilling to accept the cooperation theory. It might be right but co and for the future, but cooperation has never been permanent in the past. More important for today, are we willing to risk the consequences of testing Professor Cohane's theory and then find out that it is wrong? After we withdraw from Europe and then discover that cooperation is declining, what will we do? Uh, Cohane may be right, but I personally am not willing to test his proposition. Now, set aside these theories for a moment and speculate on the basis of recent history and common sense about why economic cooperation has been possible in Europe and East Asia. And what would happen if U.S. forces were, in the European case, to leave Germany? Is it not puzzling that France and Italy for a number of years have allowed the German Bundesbank to set their monetary policy? Why will these old adversaries trust each other to this degree? Can you imagine an American bank taking charge of the U.S. Federal Reserve System? This year, it, be, it would be holding interest rates high to fight inflation, while President Bush wants interest rates low to stimulate the economy. Would we stand for that? Mexico bashing would make Japan bashing look trivial by comparison relations would deteriorate rapidly. Now, the proponents of the European community have long sought to achieve a supranational political authority in Europe that could enforce the rules of economic cooperation and impose a common public sector spending policy. Uh, they know there is a danger that the issues that I've just mentioned could lead to new competition. Of course, General de Gaulle, when he was president of France in the early 60s, stopped the movement toward that goal. The recent meeting at Maastricht has captured a lot of imagination, and it was to be a major step toward this goal in the 1990s. Yet behind all the optimistic rhetoric at Maastricht, European leaders are probably more sore-headed with each other than any time in recent years. Political integration in Europe is nowhere near. It is like the horizon. They can approach it indefinitely, but they will never reach it. Cohen may be right that our dominance in Europe was overestimated, but what is overlooked is the role of U.S. military forces in Germany under the NATO authority. This U.S. presence within the military alliance made it safe for the French to trust the Germans and vice versa. Even the British have yielded some of their old animosities toward the Germans and even the French to cooperate tentatively. The question, the critical question today is whether they would continue that trust if U.S. forces were withdrawn. The question is not whether Germany will become a military problem. I think that is most improbable. More important is how all the European states would behave if these troops were withdrawn. Will not the old traditions of mistrust slowly surface in many aspects of the relations short of war? And will not that slow down and perhaps even reverse much of the European economic community's progress?
Will not the states of East Europe also enter the equation, adding new difficulties for the cooperation as they compete for positions with the East European states? Now, only Germany has the potential to lead a European system, yet no one in Europe is in the least willing to follow Germany. Germany has been leading much to the irritation of the French and the British. They startled the Germans with their, uh, they, uh, uh, with their reluctance about German reunification. That is, the French and the British really startled the Germans. And in the summer of 1990, when I was visiting in Germany, I found several groups of Germans expressing deep fears about the British and French hostilities toward them. Uh, one need not go to Britain or France to hear the opposite fears expressed. They can be heard all the way across the Atlantic. Not surprisingly, most Europeans are anxious to keep U.S. troops in Germany, including the Germans, although the old Soviet threat is gone. This new post-war political climate in Western Europe does not encourage me to expect rapid progress toward a united Europe. It may, po may not pose anarchy or war in the 1990s, but if it is unchecked, it could lead quite early to the primacy of national economic policies over European community policies. And that would certainly slow, perhaps even reverse the trend toward greater economic prosperity in Europe. Now, from the European case, I believe you can see without great elaboration why the same situation exists in East Asia, especially between Japan and Korea. Korean reunification is no longer an improbable thing. The collapse of Soviet power allowed South Korea to begin to isolate North Korea and to force it to negotiate. Suppose reunification does come to the Korean Peninsula in the 1990s. Will we withdraw our troops? Both President Roe of South Korea and the traditionally anti-American opposition leader Kim Dae-jung have recently insisted publicly that U.S. troops must remain even beyond reunification. Why? Korea fears Japan far more than it ever feared the Soviet Union. <laughs> Japan, for its part, is deeply disturbed by the prospect of a united Korea. If that happens, and Korea keeps mo modernizing its large military forces, perhaps eventually acquiring nuclear weapons, Japan will seriously consider rearmament. Think for a moment about what that would do to trading relations, not only in Northeast Asia, but in Southeast Asia through the whole Rimland uh, economy, economic area in East Asia. Now, how can such adverse trends in Europe and East Asia be prevented? Keeping U.S. forces in Germany, Japan, and Korea is bound to make those trends less likely. Throughout the Cold War, these forces, are forces deployed there, in my view, have served two goals. Not only have they stood off the Soviet threat, but they have allowed old adversaries to trust each other. Our forces in Germany, in, a, in effect, defend the Germans from the British and the French. And they're beginning to perform the same role between Germany and its Polish and Czech neighbors. At the same time, they defend all the other Europeans against the subjective feelings of uncertainty about Germany. In a word, NATO with U.S. forces serves as a substitute for what Europe aspires to but cannot achieve, a supranational political authority. It keeps law and order. It makes it safe to do business across borders and invest capital in all parts of Europe. U.S. forces play the same role in South Korea and Japan. To pull them out would be like pulling out uh, the police from a prosperous sec section of Baltimore. Would it remain prosperous? Would you keep investing your capital there if the police were withdrawn? Sure, the local citizens might form self-defense groups and neighborhood watches, but would you bet your money on them keeping law and order uh, in order to guarantee your own economic uh, investment and prosperity. Here I believe you'll see why I question the guns versus butter reasoning about U.S. military commitments to NATO and to East Asia. The context is inappropriate for this guns butter idea to apply. 
In Washington or Baltimore, the issue is not police versus butter. It is how many police are necessary to ensure the continued increase in butter production. The United States has built an international security umbrella over the trilateral regions of West Europe, North America, and East Asia. Under it grew up the most remarkable economic arrangements we've ever seen. Can we remove the security umbrella without having a deleterious impact on the economic arrangements? Adverse economic developments in Europe and Japan would have a dramatic impact on the United States' economy. <clears throat> we not only import from both areas, we export massively to both. The post-war economic order has induced enormous interdependencies among these industrial regions. Perhaps not as much as between Northwest and Southwest Washington, but they're still enormous. Now, to recognize this connection is to begin to understand <clears throat> why it makes sense for the United States to pay the price for keeping the forces deployed in Europe and Asia. If we followed Congressman Solar's impulse to turn our guns in Europe into butter for domestic consumption, we would soon find that we have less butter, not more. The guns are an overhead cost that permits a larger and more profitable market. We might save money on guns, but it would hardly compensate the losses from shrinking markets as we drifted into protectionism or merely stopped expanding cooperation. <clears throat> the academic theorists, for some reason, seem to have overlooked, in my view, the most critical relationships. The neorealists would have us believe we cannot control our fate in this regard and maintain the old international security order over the West and in these trilateral regions. The cooperation theorist would have us believe that we do not need it and that we do not have the hegemonic power to keep that arrangement, even if we wanted to. They may be right about the lack of our truly hegemonic power, but no other country can provide the leadership to keep the old security structures in place and to adapt them to the new circumstances. Germany and Japan cannot, yet they remain, at least for the time being, anxious that we try. If we bash Japan enough, and if we ignore Germany sufficiently, both may give up on us. If that happens, I may have to change my view and begin to agree with the neo-realists. We cannot control our fate. We are at the mercy of the forces of international anarchy. Now, a new world order, if there is to be one, must start with solutions to the problems that I've raised tonight. A sure way to fail to find solutions is to view America's relationship with the world in the new era as a guns versus butter trade-off, which will provide a large peace dividend. If we cannot adapt the Cold War security and economic systems of Europe and East Asia and North America to the new international environment, I do not see how a new world order can be created. If we can do so, we may not be able to make the new order entirely global because some regions of the world are already deeply into anarchy. But we can limit the anarchy, and perhaps we can re reduce the portion of the world in which, to which it spreads. Now, <clears throat> before I end and hear your reactions, let me, uh, uh, let me say that my arguments should not be taken as a defense of the present defense budget. That calls for another lecture. A large part of the defense dollar buys no military capability worth the name. It goes to political pork barrels and what is really welfare and should be put in other departmental budgets. Now, if that portion could be significantly reduced, we probably could maintain our foreign military commitments on a much reduced defense budget. The bigger danger today is not overspending on forces in Europe and the Far East. It is that we may cut those forces in order to protect most of the Pentagon pork barrel spending. That is precisely what is happening in the Congress today. As taxpayers, we will lose twice, first to the pork barrel, second to the decline in international economic performance as the security umbrella is taken away. Let me end here and take your questions. <laughs>
General Logan, we thank you. There's no doubt we're in the middle of a, uh, a new creation of a new foreign policy, and uh, you've made some, I think, very interesting comments uh, relevant to that particular debate. The floor is now open for questions. Yes, sir. General Odom, let me ask you a series of questions as a retired military officer. Uh, first of all, uh, isn't it true that the American public is totally cynical about military spending, which I agree we need for national security and even economic security, because of the administration of someone like Caspar Weinberger, who never saw a item of defense that he didn't want, and the enormous waste which I viewed in the military budget when we fought the Persian Gulf War without military uh, airlift, which I was associated with for a number of years, and sea lift, we had a lot of spent a lot of money that the Pentagon recommended on the wrong items, wasted billions of dollars. And isn't it rather a question which the American public doesn't want to consider as to what we should spend within the military so we have the necessary uh, national security? And in the same context, I'd like your personal views on what you think about the total misrepresentation by former military officers during the Gulf War, we saw them night after night on the tube. They were totally wrong, including one re uh, retired Air Force Chief of Staff who was fired by the President, making a living uh, misrepresenting what was happening. The misrepresentation of the smart bombs in, in uh, the Gulf War, when we really had a lot of iron bombs that won the war, and the failure of the American people as a whole, through lack of universal service, to be involved in the military decisions that our future may depend on. Now, those are a lot of questions, but I'd like you to sort them out and answer any one of them the best you can. The, uh, having been NBC's talking head during the war, <laughs> maybe I'm not the person to answer that. But, um, you know, I hinted at the end, or I didn't hint, I was fairly blunt in the end of my comments about uh, a number of the issues you raise. Uh, Secretary Weinberger had his virtues. He could get the money. He had his vices. He turned it over to the services and let them spend it however they wanted to. And the services were designed by the Congress to be kind of a feudal arrangement where nobody's in charge. And they all cut their private deals with the Congress and you and I as taxpayers are the losers. You know, I've in a, I have a chapter in a little book on rethinking American security, and I'm expanding it for another uh, publication in which I take on some of these force structure issues. I mean, I could go on at some length about redesigning the force structure. You want some illustrative examples? I, I, I get, if you want to see where some of the major pork in the budget is, and it's going to hurt you, some of you people are going to get upset with this. Almost, I'd say, 60% of what we spend on the National Guard is sheer welfare. There are 10 divisions in the National Guard. Five of them are organized on a 1960s TOE, Table of Organization Equipment. <clears throat> they are not usable in anything but riot control. There is one light division which doesn't have enough equipment to do anything but get itself in trouble if it's transported to some far reach of the world. There are four heavy divisions. Those, for the price, the money we pay for three of those divisions, we could have two active duty divisions. Yet the National Guard advertises this arrangement as a great saving to use the tax board. It is an out and out dead loss. Now, you know, the individual Guard members are patriotic people. There are a lot of patriotic people. But the National Guard Association is absolutely swindling the public in allocating this money that way. Now, let's go to another. In my own service, I'll take it on first. We need an airborne core about like we need a hole in the head. Nobody's going to drop an airborne core anywhere. I doubt that you'll ever see another division-sized airborne operation. A couple of airborne brigades and the three Ranger battalions, I think, are adequate for forced entry. We should convert all those to heavy units. Low-intensity conflict is an illusion. In the third world, there are modern weapons, and we can use heavy forces in most places. 
And what we are most short on, and it became very clear in the President Gulf, is active duty regular divisions. The Army's end strength had to be pushed up nearly to 900,000. It is now headed down to 530. Below that, if Sonny Montgomery and the National Guard heroes in the Congress get their way, they, we could not repeat Desert Storm today in light of the Port Barrow activities, uh, and I, put, I make the Guard largely to blame for that. Now, the Marine Corps, some of you may be Marines. They're very brave soldiers and all that, but they were maybe useful in World War II. But there are a lot more modern and effective ways to cross beaches today than the way the Marines do it. The Marines are not adequately equipped. They were poorly equipped for the operations in the Persian Gulf. They had two divisions with no uh, regularized core headquarters to run them. They had to turn to the Army for the logistics. Their tanks had to stay back because they feared the T-72s. Uh, a brigade of the 2nd Armored Division actually made the breakthrough in their sector. Uh, and closed off, uh, somewhat belatedly, the escape from Kuwait City. We, the, the Marines are essentially an antique we continue to enjoy because of sentiment. Uh, we may want to keep a small amount of them, but four divisions, three active and one, uh, one reserve, when you're coming down to 12 Army divisions, that makes no sense at all. 15 carriers, 14 carriers, the carrier was a marvelous piece of equipment in World War II when airplanes couldn't fly very far. There is no place over the northern Atlantic you can't swarm with air power from land-based air. Having a carrier for the North Atlantic makes no sense whatsoever in this epoch. Nor does it make any sense to have them in the Persian Gulf or in the, uh, the uh, uh, Mediterranean or most other areas of the world. You could cut down to four or five carriers and what the Navy really ought to do is to cut its maintenance and its investment in those things and take that money and be in an R&D program for a new modern 21st century Navy. What you now have is a post-World War II Navy facing a new epoch of high technology. I mean, I can go on to a large number of others. Now, let's, this may hit Maryland. You have the Ballistics Research Lab, uh, 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 the B, uh, BRL out here at, Fort, uh, at Aberdeen. Probably ought to be closed down. Most of the Army labs are engaged in what I call unnecessary originality. Almost all the technology has been invented elsewhere. It migrated into the civil sector. That's true with most of the defense labs, most of the Navy labs, and virtually all the Army and Air Force labs. You try to close them down. Congressional delegations will stop you cold. That's where the money is. It's not in the troops. You've, <clears throat> you've presented some interesting points. Uh, I'd like to have you expand a bit, if you can, on the term that you have used in relationship to our troops in Europe. When you use law and order, and then make an analogy back to Baltimore with our police, what is the law that goes with law and order with our troops in Europe? What is the law that they are enforcing? And what is the law that we abide by that they are enforcing? Remember Granada and Panama. Uh, the, uh, it's a good question, and my analogy is merely illustrative, and I would push it too far. The point I'm making is that there is a sense of order in Western Europe that has allowed a level of cooperation among century old, centuries old adversaries, which we've not seen before. All you have to do is talk to foreign policy specialists, government officials in Paris about their concerns over Germany and you will not be very optimistic about the future of European cooperation today. You go to Germany and you hear exactly the same thing. Uh, and the one factor that they see as changing the prospect to the better is the maintenance of some U.S. presence. 
Our presence there is different from the presence of any other country's forces simply because we have no territorial claims, no, no old grudges with these countries. Uh, we also have the advantage of being a multi-ethnic mixed culture. Therefore, we're not seen as a single ethnic group. One of the great problems for Germany and Japan to assume a larger leadership role is their ethnic homogeneity. They frighten their neighbors. You're nobody in the world unless you have a bunch of immigrants in the United States who formed a lobby group for your country. You could even rank the lobby groups of foreign countries uh, in this country. So, you know, we're not seen so much as the typical national state. We're a very special kind of state. And with it comes some very special kinds of capacities to lead in cooperative international arrangements, capacities that the two strongest other states in the world today simply do not have, Germany and Japan. Uh, I merely use the law and order arrangement in a, in a rough fashion. Clearly, there is no set of, of law in the sense that you have law here in, in Baltimore. I would argue, though, and it's an interesting analogy that you raise, that over time, something equivalent to kind of an international, that is, within a limited number of states in Europe, a trans-state common law of practice about security affairs uh, has already begun to take hold. Uh, let, let, let me give you a little sociological vignette that I think says something. I, I don't know how one converts it into uh, direct causal uh, relationships, but uh, when General Rogers retired as SACUR and General Galvin, who's my classmate from West Point, became the SACUR, we, we were witnessing a big generation change. There were no more officers on act active duty over there who had fought in World War II. Uh, I know a lot of the senior military in a number of the NATO countries personally quite well. And the thing that has struck me about those friendships and contacts is that they value them among each other. Germany has traditionally been a very unpopular country in Norway. Uh, General Ida, formerly commander of the forces in Norway, now the chairman of the NATO military committee, uh, is about a year or two younger than me. He grew up after the war. He went to the NATO staff college with German officers. He served with them in NATO. They are some of his best friends. He spends his vacations in Germany with his German friends. Inconceivable before. F Turkish and Greek officers are civil and friendly in NATO headquarters. I think the socialization of the military elites in this part of the world, in the NATO framework, and the NATO headquarters, both in Brussels and in AF North, Af Allied Forces North, Allied Forces Center, and Allied Forces South, can, can in the future continue this socialization. If you break that up, I don't think it means necessarily that we're headed to war, but it certainly breaks a social linkage that's bound to bear on how these states view one another and the kinds of compromises they will make. And the tone, the milieu, and the relationships are very much of a function of the American's presence. And it's a presence that we bring from our own uh, self-definition of a nation as based on law and not on color, not on uh, ethnicity, and not on what your name is. So it's a, it's, a, it's a fairly subjective argument I'm making, and as I said, it's a tentative one. Uh, and I'll take on board your point that there are problems with the analogy. Uh, General, you used the uh, term antique to describe what the, uh, you used the term antique mm -hmm. when describing the Marine Corps, and I'd ask you uh, a question in concerning the MPF and uh, sustaining heavy divisions with the Army and also the uh, LCAC. Mm -hmm. Now, if you look at um, 82nd Airborne dropping in in the Persian Gulf, they initially were sustained by the MPF, which was 
my understanding, you know, born out of the uh, Marine Corps, and uh, talking about uh, projecting power across hostile uh, shore, what other force is going to be able to do that besides the Marine Corps? And if you take, for example, uh, Just Cause, the Army had a base in the country they were invading. How are these heavy divisions going to be projected? Well, the, the logistics based on ships in the Indian Ocean uh, could just have well been Army forces. There was a debate, and it was, which I was a, a witness to from the National Security Council staff, and those decisions being made. The Army just didn't choose to go do that. The Marines did, and I think it was smart. Uh, and they should have done it because the Navy and the Air Force were not going to buy the strategic left. And what the Army banked on was the strategic left. Uh, I'm not saying we don't need some across the beach forces. I'm saying we don't need four divisions. We don't even need three divisions. And I think we do need some residual force like that that keeps up the skill. The thing I'm struck by is that the places you want to intervene swiftly are by and large not on the coast. You, you get on the coast, it's a long way to the capital. It's also a long way from wherever you're posted to sail to, to do these interventions. Uh, you can, the, the advantage of the 82nd Airborne is that it can move out of Fort Bragg to the desert faster than the Marines can get from uh, uh, one of the bases in the Indian Oceans. They can get there faster. The problem with the Marines, and I put them exactly in the same category, uh, with the 82nd Airborne, it, they are as an, an antique force as well. They're, they're not heavy enough to uh, be a significant force. We were really in harm's way as long as the 82nd was the only thing we had out there. Now, there are other things we could do. We could have built light airborne division, mechanized divisions to be airdroppable the way the Soviets did. We, the Army chose not to do that. Uh, I would keep a limited airborne force so that I could seize airheads and have heavy forces landed behind them very quickly. Uh, sir, uh, President Bush talks about a new world order. I guess that's a, that's a key word today. And I think that new world order is being built upon the economic uh, relationships between countries, you talk about that, we're seeing that. We export to Europe, they export to us. Uh, yet, you seem to say that without the American presence in Europe, it'll all fall apart, that the New World Order is purely being held together by American forces. What about the UN? What about the fact that countries now need each other for, for exports and imports. You seem to discount that and say that yeah. without military it all falls apart. Where is the UN? Where is this new world order? Well, I didn't say anything. About, you know, President Bush has used the term. He hasn't given a lot of substance. I was suggesting some substance here, and that would be to keep the German and the Japanese connections, military connections with the U.S. solid. My own view, if you want a shorthand, if you keep German-American military ties solid and Japanese-American military ties solid, you can't start a war in Europe, and you'll lose one if you start it in East Asia. If you look back over the century, when there have been bad or no U.S.-German ties, you've had wars in Europe. When you've had a strong German-U.S. tie, you have peace in Europe, and the same in the Far East. Uh, <clears throat> now, the uh, look at the way you see, the, the view you have is one that I, I'm troubled by. I don't have an unambiguous answer for, but I tried to elaborate what I think is a, a fairly sophisticated argument as to why the political relations among states will prevail over the economic relationships. If you look back in the 19th century, the Zollverein included a large number of states and a large number of the German states. I didn't keep them from going to war. They went to war in short order. And if you listen to this country talk about Japan, you'd think that that was our major new Soviet threat. The problem is, we, you know, the Japanese may not be uh, the greatest free traders in the world, 
But who are we to complain? If I were the Japanese and Carla Hills came and complained to me about rice imports, I would say, we're going to file an anti-dumping case against the United States because you subsidize rice. You not only subsidize it, but it uses so much water in California that it creates big environmental problems. And, you know, we're not about to buy your rice. And then, after I'd heard the Americans yell about that for a while, then I would drop my import barriers to rice. And whose rice do you think the Japanese will buy? They won't buy our rice. They'll buy Thai rice and our Australian rice because it's a lot cheaper. I mean, you know, we, we talk this free trade, and I think we don't believe a word of it. What do you think of the possibility of adding some of the newly freed Eastern European states to NATO, such as Poland or Czechoslovakia, and if they do get added, which is certainly not certain, would it help? You've asked a bigger question. Let me just expand your question. I, I think what that question uh, really points to is the what sort of policy we need toward East Europe and Russia. Uh, directly, you can't take, or I, I would not be in favor of taking those states immediately into NATO for this reason. NATO states have come to set a standard that, of entry a, a, as including a domestic liberal democracy that's fairly stable. It is not clear at all that Czechoslovakia, Hungary, and Poland are going to make it as stable democracies. They may. And when they do, then I think we should take them into NATO. In the meanwhile, I don't think we can be passive. And if you looked at General Galvin's comments recently when he was visiting Poland, I agree with them. We have to have some sort of status that involves them. We have to keep a dialogue going on because there is insufficient military power in these states to fill up the vacuum that's been left by the absence of the Warsaw Pact, by the collapse of the Warsaw Pact. Sooner or later, neighbors to the left or right will be messing around in that region in a, in, a, in, a, in a dysfunctional fashion. And therefore, some kind of security arrangements need to be made to fill it up. And I think the best instrument for the U.S. to exercise leadership in for that purpose is NATO. Therefore, I think some sort of associate status, steps toward eventual status, are absolutely critical. And if anything, we've been too late coming to that. That was very much for that in 1990-91. Now it's, thank goodness, there's more attention to it. Now, there's a bigger issue. What about the Ukraine? Leonid Kravchuk, the president of the Ukraine, is here today. And what about Russia? We've got to look at Europe, not just as NATO. We've got to look at Europe as Europe to the Urals, if I may borrow de Gaulle's phrase in that regard. And we now are on the horns of somewhat of a dilemma. I had a couple of hours in private conversation with uh, uh, General Morozov, the Ukrainian defense minister. He was here a few weeks ago to see Secretary Cheney. And uh, I tried to get him to explain what, he, what his intentions were, what, what message are you bringing here? And he didn't have uh, a big picture. He had only an endless list of complaints against Russia. And he wanted the U.S. to intervene on the Ukrainian side. And I explained to him that, or tried to, not very successfully, that uh, we have to think about other states too. And, and, and if the Ukrainian, if a Ukrainian leader such as he came here and gave us the image of the future they see there as, say, Ukraine wants the relationship with, the United, with Russia that Canada has with the United States, we would understand that. But all we hear from you is that we're about to go to war with Russia. Uh, now, there are deeper reasons of why the Ukraine, uh, why Ukraine has taken this particular path. I think there are real fundamental questions as to whether the Ukraine can cohere as a new state over time. Uh, I would argue that while I think the administration has been slow to recognize the Ukraine. And I think President Bush's speech in Kiev when he was there is one of the, we were still paying for that. 
Uh, that was, I think that's most unfortunate. We do have to take the Ukraine serious, and if the Ukraine could become a stable democratic state in Eastern Europe, that is in the strategic interest of Western Europe, our strategic interest, uh, <clears throat> because that will make it less likely that we'll see the reassertion of an imperial impulse by Russia. To me, the big question for that whole region today is whether Russia. <clears throat> Russia has been locked in a vicious circle of internal structural problems that made it imperial for several centuries. And the problems were their economy, the essentially driven economy even in the czarist days and the oppression of the peasantry, the nationality question, they, they, can, they ruled over non-Russian peoples, and the military question, the requirements for military power to keep the empire together. If you want the Russian or Soviet military to decline, then you need, they have to get rid of the nationalities because one of the major roles of the military was to keep it together. The breakup of the, of the empire was a precondition for any prospect of liberal development there. So I think Russia now has a choice. It can move on and try to achieve a liberal democratic development, or it can reassert its imperial instinct and try to extend its hegemony over the territories that were once part of the Russian Empire. Uh, I have been impressed by Yeltsin and by many of the Russian uh, so-called members of so-called democratic Russia uh, the so-called Russian liberals, uh, because I remember the Russian liberals, the Constitutional Democrats in 1917, when they had a choice between getting out of the war and letting the Ukraine separate, which it tried to do in December 1917, they chose empire over liberalism. It was interesting to me that to date, Mr. Yeltsin, whose credentials are hardly liberal, but has advised by some liberals, and many of the Russian liberals around have chosen uh, to abandon the empire in favor of a liberal democratic experiment. Now, that won't ensure their success with it, but if Russia concerns itself with its own internal regeneration and restructuring, redevelopment, then I think the disorders in the former Soviet Union will be limited. There will, there will be many, but they'll be disaggregated, and I don't think there will be a big war. If, if Russia somehow is tempted to reassert its influence in the other regions, then I think, indeed, we'll have very serious and broad confrontations. To, just to end that point, Russia is really an important element in, our, in, 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 in how we handle the whole Atlantic connection.